is up guys, Nick here, and today we're gonna to be taking an in-depth look at my Iron Man suit. So if you don't recognize this suit, which I don't blame you whatsoever, this is the Mark 20 Python. This suit would have been in Iron Man 3 at the final battle when Tony calls the Iron Legion to help him with the extremist soldiers. You'd have to go frame by frame through the entire climax of the movie to spot it. I have watched Iron Man 3 I don't know how many times and I've yet to see this suit in the background of the final battle, but that's besides the point. And of course I looked up quite a few wikis to get reference pictures of this bad boy and so many of them have pictures of the Mark 21, the Midas suit, which is all gold. And they say, oh yeah, this is the Mark 21. It's not, you can tell because it has the Mark 7 legs. This one has the Mark 17 legs. Anyways, so let's get into it, shall we? Here is the helmet. You might start recognizing some of the details on this. Uh, this helmet is actually the Mark 33 helmet or the Silver Centurion helmet, but in a different color. This particular model was designed by Do3D. And it's rather neat because it only comes in three pieces. So you have the dome and the jaw that's all connected together. Then you have this entire back panel, which is one part. And then you have the faceplate. Sure, it's a little bit more difficult to sand and to paint afterwards, but at least you don't have to attach different little parts together. So the number one question I always get about my Iron Man suit is, how do I open the faceplate? Like, how did you do that? Oh my God, so fancy. And to be quite honest, it's rather simple. So I have a button inside of my chin, which I press with my jaw. There we go. But it's kind of a pain because you need it close enough that you can press it rather easily. But if it's too close to your chin, you're just gonna be opening and closing your faceplate like at random times. I've tried to have conversations while this was on the first convention I went to, and I was just cutting people off mid-sentence. It was so embarrassing. <laughs> and this was rather easy to print too. I was able to print this on a CR6 SE, which is 22 by 22 by 25 centimeters. The only big change I had to do to the SDL files, and this wasn't necessarily to get it to fit. This was to improve the print quality afterwards so I wouldn't have to do a bunch of post-processing. And that was cut off the jaw. So the jaw could print standing and I could print the dome like this. Actually, I printed it like this. Anyways, but I did have to modify the helmet slightly so that it would fit me better. So I'm just gonna open this up and show you. So this is the backplate of the helmet. The original STL model doesn't include these magnetic mounts. So I designed these in Tinkercad and I printed them out. And once I did that, I just fused them in place with the soldering iron. Along with the magnet mounts, I also had to slice up the inner ear pieces. So there was this giant ridge along the circumference of the ears and they would just bulge into my head. And I had to change the dimensions of the helmet quite a bit to have it fit my head without it looking too terribly big on the suit. So I increased the width of the helmet to 106% and I also increased the height and the depth to 102% just so it wouldn't look too blocky. And then I threw it into Blender to cut off the ridge around the ear just to make it a little slimmer. That way it would actually fit my head just like that. But once I made the modifications to the back plate, it actually fits me rather well. So I'll just throw this on. Out. There we go. It's a very tight fit because I didn't want the helmet to look too big on my suit. And I can actually talk pretty well right now. I managed to get the switch exactly where I needed it to. That way I can close the faceplate without like cutting people off and stuff. Just like that. And you might also notice there is a blue glow on my face right now. Yes, I do have a blue backlight in my room, but I actually added LEDs inside of my helmet. I modified the code slightly so that this would work, but I added tiny blue, where are they? There they are. I added tiny blue LEDs inside the faceplate. That way when the faceplate is open, it gives this nice blue glow on my face, almost like there's a heads up display in my helmet. I got this idea from Kiara's workshop. She did something very similar for her Mark VI suit. All I had to do was go into the code and add an extra output for an LED and then indicate it to turn off when the faceplate's closed and turn on when the faceplate is open. I will be showing you guys in full detail how to do that very soon. I am working on a brand new Mark 20 helmet for my Iron Man suit, 
There are a few things I'm not quite pleased with when it comes to this particular helmet. For one, the clear coat isn't perfect. There, there's a little bit of orange peeling going on and the edges between the gold and the gunmetal on certain parts aren't really that well masked off. And speaking of paint, these are the paints that I ended up using for this suit. So I decided to go with the Rust-Oleum Universal Metallic Oil Rubbed Bronze. This color is super nice. It's a dark gunmetal, but it has sparkles in it, and it looks absolutely fantastic. And for my gold, I ended up going with a Duplicolor Wheel Coating Gold. One of the most difficult things about painting this suit was the masking, because both of these paints don't really like masking tape, even the very gentle kind. So not only did I need to let the paint dry for an extended amount of time just to be sure, I also had to come up with strategies to make sure I could get rid of the marks that masking tape would sometimes leave behind, like using Goo Gone or WD-40 to wipe away the tape marks. And since I was using those products, I needed to be sure that the parts were super, super clean before I put on the clear coat. I ended up going with a Duplicolor 1K Clear High Gloss Finish. I went through so many of these cans and it was so expensive because I would just drench my parts in clear coat. And for the most part, it came out amazing. I recently learned that for some reason in Canada at Napa Auto Parts, they sell 2K cans of clear coat for less than a can of Duplicolor 1K clear coat. Yeah, that's annoying. <laughs> the more you know. Plus there are a few missing details to the helmet. Like for example, these are the wrong cheek pieces. If you look at the Mark 33 helmet in Iron Man 3 at the final, in the final battle when Tony has the face plate up, he has these giant hexagonal panels in his cheeks. And Levy3D just recently shared files for a Mark 33 helmet on his Instagram. So I bought some of those and I made a few modifications to them and I already started printing them. I'm considering making an entire tutorial series on how to make an Iron Man helmet from A to Z. So let me know in the comments down below if you'd like to see that. While I'm at it, I might as well show you guys how I did some of the wiring in here. So you'll see there's that little gray box there. That is an Arduino case I 3D printed that protects the Arduino. And right back here, that is a 5,000 milliamp hour battery pack. And with the battery pack being in my helmet and the switch being in my jaw, this means the helmet is completely independent of the rest of my suit. So when I get like a little too hot or uncomfortable in my Iron Man suit, I'll simply ask my handler to take my helmet off and he doesn't have to mess around with wires or anything. He can just take the back plate off and take the entire helmet off. And you'll see those hinges in there. These weren't part of the original SDL file. These are by Crashworks 3D on their Thingiverse page. I downloaded them. I don't remember which helmet it's for exactly, but I downloaded those, installed them, and the faceplate works just fine. So setting all that aside, we're now gonna take a look at the legs. There we go. Ugh. I think that's gonna be fine. If it falls on camera, I'm going to laugh and then proceed to cry. So I managed to take off one of the legs. Let's start with the shoes. So the shoes are quite literally an old pair of Adidas sneakers with two covers on both sides. So you have the one covering the toes and you have another one covering the heel. And the way that these stay on is I have an elastic at the very bottom of both parts, keeping it on the shoe. And I also have an elastic going from the front, wrapping around my ankle to keep it on my toes and the same idea for the ankle piece i have an elastic going around my ankle from the front like this why was there so much dust they have taken quite a bit of damage but that's fine because literally nobody ever looks at my shoes also a nice little pro tip if you don't want the elastics to get all wonky when you're putting on the shoe you can tie them in between the laces that way they always keep their shape and you can put these on super easily i can have my legs on and put on my shoes no problem these shoes are part of the Mark 17 Heartbreaker STL files by Do3D. So what I did to scale these is I measured the outermost edges of my shoe and then compared it to the STL file. And before I started scaling these, I immediately chopped the bottoms off because when you get a pair of shoes in an STL file, typically for an Iron Man suit, it's like the entire boot. Like you have the bottom, you have the top, you have literally everything. I didn't need that because I was doing a shoe cover so I immediately just plain cut the bottom of the shoe. And once that was done, then I started scaling everything. So I made it a little bit wider, a little bit shorter at the front, same thing for the ankle. And just to make sure that the covers would actually conform to my shoe, I hit both parts with a heat gun extensively, 
while I was wearing my shoe. And then once they were hot enough, I pushed the cover onto my shoe and like molded it to my shoe. How many times can I say the word shoe in one video? Shoe. Moving on, let's take a look at the leg. So these bad boys are also part of the Mark 17 files from Do 3D. I'm 5'8", so these legs were like insanely long. Like they were for someone who's like 6'6'4". Six, six, so out of all the parts for my Iron Man suit, the legs are the ones that I changed the most in terms of scale. The thighs I managed to print in one single piece on my Anycubic Cobra Max, and the calves I actually printed in four different parts. Because if I can do this on camera... Uh, oh, there we go. So, the uh, calves are actually two halves, and I just used magnets to attach both halves together. There we go. So it's literally just magnets holding everything in together. These like rarely come off. They're super, like you just saw, they're super difficult to take off and I don't need them to take off. I can just slip the legs on, no problem. So when I printed these, I printed them in two halves, meaning I had four pieces just to build the shins. So you can see on the inside, there's a seam coming across this entire piece. And on the outside, you can barely tell. Even in the glare with the high gloss, you can't even see that seam. So if you guys want a video tutorial on how I fuse parts together and get rid of that seam, let me know in the comments below. Before I reattach this, I'm actually going to show you the mounts I created for the knee. So these silver bits are actually a double hinge that are geared together. And these are from orthopedic knee braces. I got mine off of Amazon for like 30-ish bucks. Totally worth it. The reason why I wanted to hinge my knees like this is I didn't want the knee to be misaligned whenever I'm standing. I wanted the thigh to be aligned with the knee and the knee to be aligned with the shin. And also when I bend my knee, it evenly opens up where the knee goes. So the knee isn't attached to the shin nor is it attached to the thigh. It's its own separate piece and it always stays aligned no matter what. So it looks great in pictures is what I'm saying. <laughs> but I didn't want this to be one solid piece forever. So what I did is I designed my own mounts for the knee. You can see them right here and here. And there are two more on the thigh. I drilled holes through the aluminum of the knee braces and I tapped them for screws. So these are literally just screwed in and the plastic mounts are fused to the plastic. So this is like a super solid bond. It's never going to break, but I can unscrew it apart and put it in my luggage, no problem. To be quite honest with you guys, getting the hinges to be aligned with both the shin and the thigh before fusing everything in place was a pain. Next time I do something similar to this, I might modify the STL files of the shin and thigh to create slots for the mounts. That way I don't have any guesswork. It's already pre-aligned with everything. He looks like he's about to fall over, doesn't he? He's just leaning. And one last thing for the thighs, I added this nylon strap. It's super glued in there. And this literally just buckles into my harness and keeps the legs from sagging down. Now I'm starting to get worried about this guy. So I'm gonna take him apart and we're gonna look at the abs and the back section. And that should be enough for today. Oh, and really quickly, ugh. Here's the neck piece. There's really not a lot to talk about. There's bungees on one side, there's magnets on the other. It goes around my neck. Ow, 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 ow. And it just attaches around my neck just like that. Fairly simple and it detaches. Yeet. I just threw that right to the thigh. <laughs> Nothing broke, we're good. This is the back plate and the ab plate of my Iron Man suit. So basically I have magnets on the abs that stick out just like that. And I have magnets inside of the back plate and they overlap on top of each other. That way they can't pull apart. So if I just slide them together and it just attaches like that, there's barely a seam. They can't pull apart, but they can push apart like this though, which is a problem. But for the most part, it stays together really, really well. You might notice that the top ab plate is missing. That's because it's attached to my chest and it slides over them whenever I move. Also, I trimmed these sections down considerably because like my, my legs like to be together. So like I can't have giant chunks of plastic in between my thighs. It just doesn't work. I do have tiny little snaps because this uh, crotch plate moves around. So this secures it to one side and I have straps securing it to the other. Also, funny story, I'm gonna show you guys something. So whenever I was sizing this suit, 
Um, I did get the vast majority of the dimensions correctly. The only problem is the back of the Mark 7 design has this weird curve in it. So I measured based off of this, but my back never reaches this far back. It stays like here. So the depth of the ab and back piece was completely wrong and it didn't fit me properly. So this is how I got around that. I went back into the slicer and I sliced a thin one inch segment of this part of the back panel. And I reprinted that, stuck it to the side, fused it together and then did tons of body work to cover up the seams. And that gave me just enough extra depth so that I could wear both the back and the out piece together. And that's gonna be it for today, guys. Stay tuned for part two of this series where I'll be covering the upper body and the arms of this suit. And I'll be covering all the electronics in detail, especially for the back flaps, the smoke machines, the lasers, the missile launcher, all of it. If you like this type of content and you wanna support me, please go check out my Kofi in the description down below where you can make a donation. And you'll also find a link to an Amazon shopping cart where I have a bunch of supplies and tools that I use to make this sort of stuff. Really hope you guys enjoyed this video and I'll see you in the next one. Oh no, he said. There we go.